Man, it's good to have everybody tonight while we're getting all situated. And you got a few late bloomers from New Mexico showing up, and uh, <laughs> we're good. Murphs are here tonight. How many of y'all said praise the Lord when you saw the Murphs here tonight? Yes, we'll have a little singing. That'll kind of buffer the blow a little bit. We, uh, Man, we're going to have a good time in the Lord, and we've been having a good time. Uh, it's... Uh, you know, been a pretty interesting deal. I don't think I've seen y'all. Maybe I have, but I can't remember when the last time, how much has gone on. But, you know, we had the men's prayer thing over at New Mexico a couple weeks ago. That was an interesting time in the Lord. And I think there's a lot of people that enjoyed it, and I think there's some that didn't. And uh, that that's plumb okay. Uh, you know, we've gotten to visit on a couple different platforms here over the last few weeks. Went and talked to the Jenners Association Monday morning at Lubbock, and uh, that was that was a really good time because I don't know anything about gin and cotton. I told them I said I grew up in Oklahoma, so I think I went to a Jenners meeting one time, but I don't think it had anything to do with cotton. And so we, uh, I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. But the same stuff we've been talking about over and over and over and over, and I'm not going to quit, is this, this institution of family. And so Sunday morning we had a little gathering there after the horse sale. And, man, there's some guys about to suck their slippers through their nostrils when you get talking about family. And so before we get in the Word here tonight, I just... Notice something while I was doing all this. We have a family in the, you know, kind of in the body of Christ here. I'm not one of them cuddly pastor guys. Have y'all ever noticed that? Like if your nose is running, I'll hand you somebody else's clean eggs <laughs> or tell you to find your own, you know. So, you know, we come in here and teach and learn and do and encourage everybody in their family. Because even what we do here today, I believe God has ordained it. God called us to it to learn Scripture so we can go home and apply it in our own families. But as far as an institution of religion goes, that's not a God thing. God didn't design that. In fact, God established a perfect heaven and a perfect priesthood and all that's laid out in the book of Hebrews. But the one thing he did establish, he established a man and a woman, marriage and a family, is what he established in the earth. The institution of marriage and family. You can't find anything else. He poured out his spirit and the kingdom was exposed here. And I just want to ask you to think about something tonight, and it really doesn't have anything to do with what we're going to teach tonight. But I want you to think about how dependent you are in the institutions of men around you, institution of government, institution of education, institution of religion, institution of medicine, institution of enter entertainment, institution of finance. I want you to think about how dependent you are in your life to those institutions. And then compare it to how dependent you are on your family. That'll give you something really good to think about. Because one of the things we've noticed over time by promotion of this book. See, that's really what I'm supposed to do is promote this book. Sometimes I get off center and I just find out, I just, I just explain to everybody what's wrong with everything. But the truth of the matter is I should be exposing this book. But because of this book, we became dependent on this book. And as we became dependent on this book, we became less dependent on the institution of education. I didn't need anybody else to tell me what this book means. We became totally independent of the institution of finance because we now live in God's economy. 
not very dependent. I'm going to say this, that you don't need them. You might need them. Use them when you need them. But the institution of medicine is not, not going to dictate my calendar as I grow older in life. I hear people say that, and I did that drives me nuts. Well, you know, when you get old enough now, it'll just be about doctor's appointments. No, I'll tell you, when I see a doctor is when he can heal steers really good. I'll have him come rope with me. But we become so dependent. So when we get to running our own business in our life, my business, our business, I noticed this weekend I am absolutely dependent on my family for everything we do, 100%. And guess what? Unlike other institutions, I can trust them. They give great advice. They show up early and they stay late. How many of y'all had a little trouble with employees figuring out whether they're going to show up early, stay late, or even show up at all? My family's not there for the check. They're there because we're there for each other. This is what we do. When we have problems, we don't have a Rolodex of preachers and deacons and elders and counselors and people to call and say, hey, come, come fix us today. No, we just get in the pile and knock it out. That's what we do. We just get in the pile and knock it out. We got a lot of issues. We're a heck of a long way from perfect. But... I have become not only dependent on God, but totally dependent on my family. The institution established in this earth by God and the only one. So I just wanted to share that with you today because I'm a promoter of the family. I told those Jenners Monday morning, I said, look, if you don't get family back in the farm one of these days, you ain't going to have no farm. We'll have a Chinese farm. Get the family back in the farm. Because we need your help getting the family back in America. If we don't get the family back in America, we're not going to have an America. Because it's God's institution. So that's my little prelude to the singing today. Just something to think about. It's got nothing to do with the teaching unless I veer off down that trail after a while. You know, you never know which way we're going to go. But uh, anyhow, glad you all are here uh, we're going to get the Murphs up here. Let's pray right quick, and we'll get to going. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you tonight. Thank you for our families. Thank you for what you established in the earth by your design. Lord, I'm thankful for everything that will assist, assist us in our daily lives. Everything that helps us to gain knowledge or wisdom or direction or helps us run our business, our families, our stuff. But, Lord, may it all be done under your direction, your discretion, and may it all be done to your glory. And, Lord, may we come to a place where we do just totally depend on you and the people around us. So tonight, Lord, help us to receive your word that we can walk out of here better than we came in. That, Lord, we can go live your word to your glory, not just sit around and do what Christians do, sitting in a pile once a week. Let's get out and do something. And so, Lord, help us do that. We just love you and we praise you tonight, Jesus. Give you all the glory, Jesus. Amen. You know, I was just reading this today in Galatians, and it says, Don't boast in anything except the cross. But I'm going to boast a little bit about my little bride. Yesterday, we celebrated 42 years together. So that was, uh, thank y'all, and uh, six children and a few son-in-laws and 12 grandkids, so there's 25 of us now, and uh, so I, I boast that I'm probably the richest man in here. I'm not the wealthiest for sure, but, but probably the richest, or as rich as some of y'all too. <laughs> But to boast in nothing but the cross. That's what Galatians, that's what Paul said. I'm, I ain't going to boast in anything but the cross. So I just thought today, tonight, we'd just sing about the cross. And this is one you'll all know. It's an old 
that you, if he's raised in church, he'll know this. And so let's stand up. I don't think we have the words tonight, but y'all know the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old
Be seated. While we were singing them songs, I was thinking about something very especially I cling to the old rugged cross. So many of them songs we sing about Jesus, but the next time we do, uh, next time you come together, next time you ride around, you pick up. Just shut your eyes while you sing it for a minute and think about singing it to Jesus. What would that look like if I was standing there to Jesus and I just mouthed the words that today, Jesus, I'm just lay my trophies down. Today, Jesus, I'm just going to cling to that cross, that one, the one you were on. And I'm going to cling to it till it comes time, Jesus. I'm going to trade you this cross, even up for a crown. Just think about that a little bit. Just some extra little tidbits to think about here while we're going through the week. You know, I'm I'm learning a little more here. It's easy. I'm as normal as anybody. We we stay busy as heck. Anybody follows us around a little bit, and I know a lot of other people do too. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get caught up in the moment. It's easy to get tangled up in a lot of stuff. Staying mindful of the Word. Not because I'm religious about it, but I need it. How many of y'all need it? How many of y'all got saved and you were just fine? <laughs> yeah. You just, got, you just got perfect and you stayed that way. Easy peasy. Uh, Tuesday morning, we it was in First Peter chapter four, and there's a piece of scripture in First Peter chapter four that I guarantee you you hadn't heard in mainstream church in a long time. But it says, "If the righteous are scarcely saved, what's the outcome of the ungodly?" And when we was talking about that in Bible study, I I said, "Look, out here we understand running out of water." What happens when your water starts to get scarce? Boy, it gets your attention, doesn't it? It gets valuable, doesn't it? Yeah. 
So what if the righteous are scarcely saved? So what if it's not like we've been told? Pray the prayer, blow some snot, buy the fire insurance. Jesus has got you. He ain't going anywhere. He looks more like Santa Claus than he does a king with blazing eyes and all the stuff. You know, just just hang out with him. Just hang out. You'll be okay. And if you don't, you know, just kind of check in there every now and then. You're okay. Yeah, let's just go ahead and say there's so much salvation around, we'll just make it cheap. Because if the righteous are scarcely saved, what's the outcome of the ungodly? The other side of that is if you know the outcome of the ungodly, maybe we ought to tell somebody. That might help a little bit too. But tonight, we're going to be over in Isaiah 55, Isaiah 54, 55, 53, 54, 55, 56. Man, that is such a story about Jesus, and it's so cool. But I was just stumbling around there this week, and I got tangled up in Isaiah 55, starting in verse 6. And I just read it and read it and read it, and I thought, this is so good. And I already had it highlighted, and it was highlighted in my latest Bible. So this is probably the seventh or eighth or ninth time it's been highlighted. And uh, I got back to it, and I just read it, and I'm thinking, man, this is a good word. I should try this. <laughs> How many of y'all ever read the Bible and said, I should try this? Seek the Lord while he may be found. That's a great idea, isn't it, Colonel? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Well, I thought he left. So did a lot of other people. I was in the church last Monday that had come Holy Spirit hanging on a banner, and I just asked everybody where he went. Why would you have a sign inviting God to a building built by human hands where the Bible says he doesn't even dwell there? So what are we doing here? Seek the Lord while he may be found. How many believe you could talk to Jesus at work? Laying in your bed. How many of y'all have ever read a magazine in the restroom? So you could, how many of y'all know you could read your Bible in there? I'm not trying to be gross or anything. I'm just telling you this all day, every day. You had not had one day of your life you didn't go to the restroom. God with you or not? Huh? I mean, this is, this is for real. Is he near or is he not? Because Western culture Christianity told you he's out there somewhere. If you'll pray loud enough and get enough of you going, he'll actually hear you. And if you're good down here, he'll be nice up there. And if you're naughty down here, he'll slap you from up there. But the whole trick is to get from here to there. And the truth of the matter, you hear me every week. The kingdom of God's at hand. It's upon us. It's within us. It's near. It's now. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Isaiah wrote that a long time before 50 days after Passover. That one time outpouring of the Holy Spirit was God was made available to all mankind who would seek him while he could be found. Have you found Jesus? He's already found you. You're no secret to God. Call upon him while he's near. Talk to him. Can you do that? See, this is one of the problems I've had with our society as in the in the fifty year removal of God's word from our public places, our schools, courthouses, things, the removal of public prayer, the removal of adult prayer in our school system, all these different things that seem to nauseate everybody. And I took my turn until I realized we had people at home who warmed the pews of buildings every week who did not understand that God was near Therefore, they never talked to him like he was near. Didn't live like he was near. When I'm at home in my prayer times, I catch myself whispering while I'm talking to Jesus. There's no need in waking the robin up. It's just me and him. We're good. Do you know he's near here now? And you just talk to him. 
I don't have to scream at Jesus. I just got to scream at some of y'all every now and then. But catch one of you kind of nodding off a little bit. He said, let the wicked forsake his way. Let them do what they're going to do. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And then let him return to the Lord. You see, there's always an opportunity for the unrighteous in our life. And this is the part i got to remind myself. You know, grace. God has grace for a lot of people that I don't have grace for. Maybe not a lot, but there, there's a couple, three, four, five, four, six. <laughs> they can come back. It don't matter how bad you've been. It don't matter. You go in prison all the time, Murph. I used to hang out around there quite a bit. The sheriff, sheriff, there's a lot of good guys in jail, ain't you? They just don't know it yet. Some of them, but they figure it out sometimes. Yeah. They'll let them come return to the Lord. Why would anybody come to the Lord? Here's how we do it in America. Here's how we've done it for years. You better get saved, Curtis Allen, because you might die tonight pulling out on the highway and you're going to hell. Isn't that how we do it? Yeah, and if you belong to the right tribe with getting that water, you're going to hell. Hurry up. Everything's about going to hell. Maybe there's some of you just been having a little of it. How about we just promote a better way to live? What if we made this for the unrighteous and the ungodly? What if we became the example in our families of men and women who served God every day, not out of a sense of religion, but out of a sense of relationship because we understood the nearness and nowness of God and our lives began to display a different way of living that brought peace and joy and people who smiled and didn't gripe and complain all the time. People that wasn't around looking for the boogeyman all the time. People who had confidence in themselves and had faith in their prayers and faith in the God that they were talking to and began to live that way in public where the unrighteous would look at you after they, you know, after they played that country song backwards 900 times and you finally get your house back and your dog back and your wife back and all that stuff. You go through all that stuff and, and they look around and they go, hey, how come you're not like me? You know, we want everybody to be like us. When are we going to start living in a way they look at us and go, how come you're not like me? Well, because. But one of these days, there's a way of living here that you just come back to the Lord. But you're going to have to do more than pray a prayer and blow some snot and have somebody lie to you about your salvation. You're going to have to truly get born again. That's how that works. The rest of that is, I don't know what that is, but that ain't, that's not this. And then he'll have mercy on him. See, I understand that. Because I went to church more than Christmas and Easter. I had a white Bible they gave me when I was 13 years old, and I passed the test. I knew when to stand up, and I knew when to sit down, and I could sing the doxology backwards. I get it. But I was unrighteous. And I was unworthy. I was a mess. I was just like he's talking about right here. The wicked. I was wicked. But guess what? When I turned around one day, Jesus didn't beat me up. He didn't cuss me out. He didn't stand me in the corner with my nose in the corner for two weeks until I qualified for salvation. <laughs> he didn't give me a list of things I need to do. Well, you just need to go take that class again. Well, after you've attended church now for two and a half years, we're going to count you worthy. Right there in my mess, he said, I forgive you. Like all of it. I mean, that's the greatest thing can happen to a man who grew up like me. I mean, I know he's got a list, and I can remember some of it. They ain't no telling how much he got wrote down. And he just wiped the page. It's like he turned around and had my book of all the crud I'd done since I was a little kid. 
And all of a sudden, there were no more words on the page. It was as though it never happened. Mercy on a sinner. That's why salvation is precious. Not to be taken for granted, not to be watered down, not to be played with, not to be lied about. It's not about your day in the tomb. It's about your day upright, living, living for the glory of God. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. I just wanted to hit on that for just a minute because I believe there's Christians everywhere that are still guilty. You're not guilty in the eyes of God, but you're guilty in the mirror when you're brushing your teeth in the morning. You've, you've characterized yourself by your mistakes because you've had so few successes and you just think you're going to be a walking screw-up the rest of your life. Don't breathe that into your children, okay? Breathe that can do. Yeah, you mess up, get up and try again. God's grace is sufficient for everything we try to do. Come back to Jesus. Come back. Because he will pardon abundantly. Does anybody know what good news that is for humans? <laughs> humans really need this. Y'all realize that? This is a good deal. But here's God. And this is the part I really want to talk about tonight. On down through here just real quick. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That finally really brought peace to my life. Because the longer I stay in this word and the longer I walk with Jesus, the harder it is for me to hear and be around different things and different people that tell different things about God and their thoughts. Well, I just believe God is this way, or I believe God's that way. Or let me tell you, we, we, we all believe God's that way. We, God is it. You know what? You don't know who God is. There ain't one of us in this building has elevated your mind to that spot yet. I'm not going to say it's impossible. I'm going to tell you it's a journey. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. God is who He is, and it does not matter what somebody says about our God. Your seminary, your theologies, your stuff will not change who God is. And we got to get that. God is absolutely God. And this Bible absolutely tells who he is, how he is, where he is right now. That's why I cannot afford for somebody else to tell me what this book says because we could get a twisted depiction of who God is because we have people in the earth who pretend to know just exactly how he is and what he's thinking. My thoughts are higher. My ways are higher. This is the heavens are above the earth. Do I have the mind of Christ? I absolutely do. Because the Bible said when I received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit from top of head to bottom feet, that I received the mind of Christ. But until I've renewed my mind, you see, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost won't renew your mind. Nowhere in Scripture does it say, let your mind be renewed by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will give you a revelation of who God is according to His Word and only according to His Word. You get revelation, but you've got to have the Word. Apart from the Word, we can do nothing. You cannot be a follower of Jesus without the Word. That won't work. You won't even know if you can hear God without the Word. You don't know if you heard God or had too much chili on your chili dog last night. You'll be another person walking around guessing. We've got people all over the world today in all kinds of spiritual gatherings where they believe everything that's spiritual is God. That's not true. The deceiver has been imitating the perfect since the beginning of time. 
If you don't believe me, go back to the book of Exodus and just read about the just read about the ten plagues and how many out of them that the magicians imitated the very same thing. That Moses stood right up there, him and Aaron, and called for things to happen and predicted things to happen. And then the sorcerers would do the exact same thing. Listen, that deceiver understands the Scriptures. That's how he twisted them in the garden. He gets it. If we don't get it, then the deceiver, even if he's up here, can tell you some things and you'll just Drink the Kool-Aid. Be careful in America today that we don't begin to worship a Jesus that doesn't exist. Ouch. We're mankind of His making. He's not the God of our making. He is who He is, and He is the I Am, and He will not change. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. What's the journey in this life to try to get there? If you won't elevate your mind, you'll never reach your full potential. We'll always remain dependent. So if he said that for the, whom the sun sets free is free indeed, and the truth will make you free, then how did we become as a society so enslaved to the institutions of men? We've got Pharaoh again, and we've got slavery again. We've got whole ethnic groups that are enslaved now to a victim mentality. We've got the captives again. Some days I feel like Moses. Let my people go. That's exactly how we prayed during the COVID fiasco. Let my people go. Jesus set the captives free. So that means free from dependency on the institutions of men. So last a week ago last Friday, when I stood in that room and I tried really hard not to say it and God just wouldn't let me off the hook, Finally, at the end, I said, if I never go to church another day, I'll be fine. You talk about sucking the air out of the room. I'm standing in one. Do you realize without people, that building does not survive? The church survives. The organization doesn't survive. But if I don't go home to my family and I don't start ministering in my gifts and I don't start tending the business at home, then I'm sunk. I'm sunk. Now, if coming to these gatherings like this right here will help you go home and do what you need to do and do what you're called to do and exercise your gift and minister to your family and, and become dependent on that institution, then by all means, let's get up and talk about it and then let's get out of here and go do it. But just to gather up because this is what makes God happy. I, some days I think it makes him want to puke watching some of this. It's almost ridiculous. Because we've took the word out of it. Don't want to do this with the word anymore. I would love, I, I would love to... You know, my family, the boys, boys are learning at home now. Now, I don't know how long we'll enjoy it, but it's nice to look over the fence and be able to see them all day. I like it. hope they learn something. But their yesterday morning's reading exercise was in the Bible, in a devotional book. You know, Daniel Webster promoted it that way. You know that... Probably over 80% of our college students in America today couldn't even read the eighth grade primer written by Daniel Webster where the alphabet was all labeled with scripture like A was for this and B is for that and it all came straight out of the Bible. And we removed all that from our society. Do you know what that tells me? It had already left our house. I've preached in churches all over this United States of America. 
Do you know who has the highest percentage of people that bring their Bibles to church that I've ever been in myself? This one. I've been in some where nobody did. Now, if you're not going to take your Bible to a Bible study, I'm pretty darn sure you don't open it at home. When you think, is this thing important? It will be after tonight. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and bring it forth in bud, that it may give, give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or fruitless, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return but water the earth and bring it forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word that goes forth it shall not return to me void it shall it shall God said it shall how many of y'all think Jesus lies if God said it shall that means that's how it is it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. I remember one time, because this gets used in a lot of prosperity messages. Seed for the sower and bread for the eater. I'm telling you, every time you get a chance, if you'll hand it to one of these guys in a 14-piece seersucker suit, they'll find everything in here and make it about the money. You guys drive, drive me nuts. Money never was seed. Don't fall for that crud. If you don't believe me, go plant a $100 bill in your backyard, come back next year and see what you got. You're going to have a musty $100 bill. It won't grow nothing. The Word. So look what we did. We took and made it all about our prosperity, didn't we? Do you want to prosper? Would you like to have money left at the end of the month or month left at the end of the money? This will show you how to sew up the holes in your purse. Seen it happen. The last time we went broke will be the last time we went broke. We've done it enthusiastically. Three times we practiced. So when COVID came and sucked a chunk out of my billfold, we just laughed. Ah, we already did this. <laughs> God's Word is faithful. So let's make a prosperity message out of this right quick. So what we did at our house, I didn't call my preacher. He wouldn't have known what I was talking about. He'd have probably told me to tithe more. Been his answer. With what? I didn't have anything. And so we gather up as a family. My girls are little. We junior rodeo. This is their life. A couple of you guys sitting around here know what I'm talking about. It takes a dollar or two to do that every weekend. I don't have very many dollars. What the bank didn't get, the IRS had already locked up, and I was in a mess. I was in nine line buying, buddy. I'm talking about like it was a real kind. It wasn't just jacking around. I had to ask permission to buy a stick of bubble gum. I mean, it was rough for, for a minute. And I just set everybody down in my house, and I, we set the Bible down. And I said, okay, here's a couple things we've got to talk about. And I'm just telling you a real-life story because I don't like telling somebody else's. So I just laid my Bible down. And I said, well, y'all, Dad has made a couple errors. I was pitching when I should have been catching. <laughs> I ain't doing very good. I got a couple issues I got to get cleared up with the bank, and I got a little issue with the IRS, and I, I got some troubles. I don't have very much money, like I don't have any. So I, what I need to know is, are y'all okay with me still being an auctioneer and doing what I do for a living? Do you think that's where I'm supposed to be? 
You think that's our life? Yeah. Y'all agree on that? Yeah. So this rodeo thing we got going on. Do you girls really feel that's where you're supposed to be? That's that's what we do? Is this what we're going to do? Is this how we're going to live? Praise God we never quit because it's extremely generational at our house. Praise God we didn't give up on stuff that's called life. They said, yeah, this is what we want to do, Dad. I said, okay, we'll figure it out. I said, I got $700 that nobody knows about. I'll get us some calves Wednesday. I bought one Murph that had a blind eye. I bought another that was crooked-headed with the ear down. I bought another that was bobtailed. I think I got four for 700 a little under 700 I think I had a little, little change left. So my girls now had four roping calves. We're rich. <laughs> We're doing good. Oh, I was still working all the time, so we muddled around. We had enough money to pay some inch fees. And I went to reading through my Bible, and we talked about it in that right there. We prayed about it, said, God, take your word and show us how to do this. And he taught me about working and receiving. He taught me about sewing up the holes in my purse, so I started looking where the leaks were. It took a long time to close up the leaks. Had a lot of leaks because I had a lot of dependency on institutions. I got the leaks tied up. We do okay now. Kelsey actually got to go to four years of college roping calves around the neck. That's all she had to do was put a little white rope around a calf's neck every weekend, and she got to go to college. Made it to nationals twice, and won a region once, and because of the word there was no other reason but because of the word and it will not return void and it will accomplish everything that god set it out to do and every task that you apply this word to it will bring it to the right place every time it'll do it every time but it's not going to happen by calling somebody up and say, can you give me a few scriptures? Well, that might work, but you're going to have to go apply them. Calling your prayer chain and just have everybody pray over you because you got your shorts on backwards. That ain't going to work. You're going to have to get undressed and put your shorts on right all by yourself. This book will tell you how to get your shorts on right. It's a good book. This book will keep you in right standing with God. So when you come undone over a state livestock inspector in the middle of your horse sale this weekend, this book will allow you to repent and call and apologize and ask for forgiveness so that you can stay in right standing with God and live in peace and not turmoil and not be all jacked up over stuff all the time. I don't want to whip anybody today because of this book. This book, it will accomplish. Now listen to verse 12 and I'm going to quit. If you do all this, for you shall go out with joy, you'll be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills will break out in singing. Do you realize as much as I love the Murphs that I can find joy, peace, and praise God with no, they're nowhere around. In fact, if I'm praising God on my own, most of you don't want to be around. It's a joyful noise, but that's at the best. Shout for joy. Have you ever stood in the, just at your house, and look around for just a minute, and it just shouts for joy back at you, everything that God has done at your home, at your home, Huh? Doesn't that kind of hit a spot? 
Yeah, I love to come up here and sing and do, but man, in my house anymore. And the more I'm in this word, the more it's happening. The word will not return void. If we're living fruitless in our society today, if we're living fruitless as Christians today, it's because we've not sown the seed of the Word of God. We've not watered it. We've not planted it. Not in our lives, not in our minds, and not in the minds of the next batch. You want things to start going different? You want to live in a more godly community, more godly country? That'll be on the next batch. We got to sow seed and watch it work. Watch how this seed works. Not just what it'll take away from my life, but have you noticed what it'll put in? The, the joy and the power and the... Just, just reading it again tonight and, and coming here in fellowship a little, I, I'm about ready to wind it up. We got done with that horse sale this weekend. It was the biggest one we've ever had in the history of that sale park. But I'm telling you, that woman right there and me, just two, two middle-aged people, we have worked our tails off on that thing. And that little slave driver right there, gosh, till Friday, we got moved down there last Wednesday and Thursday morning. She's up at 5 o'clock in the morning. She's ready to haul stuff. And we got to go. And I'm going to go up down coffee, and I'll squeeze in a coffee with the colonel right quick, and we got to get down. We got a storage building full of stuff that's got to be moved, and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff. So we did that all the way till Sunday night. Taking a couple days here, I think it's taking a little longer to recuperate than it used to. I got done with the cow sale today, and I get home, phone calls. I was going to sneak me in a nap. That didn't work. Got a little chore situation in my house, so I had to get that done. Got the stalls clean. Got up here and read my Bible a little. We were talking on the way coming up here tonight. We tired. How many of y'all got here tired? How many at night it's you're tired? And then I got to fooling around with this Bible a while ago. Anybody want to run a foot race? Feeling pretty good, Curtis. I'm feeling pretty froggy, man. This word will give you life. This word is making me excited. This word helps me to live out my hopes, my dreams, my desires. This word gives me hope. In a country that's having a really hard time finding their way. I mean, really. It's hard to get the bus to go the right direction when it's just ridden, but you know, they've heard of buffoons driving the thing. I mean, it's just crazy. But this word gives me hope. Because this word will not return void. Do you love your Bible? It's amazing to me. It would probably be disheartening to ask people, how many of you love Jesus? And everybody says yes. And then you said, how many of y'all love your Bible? And it gets a little quiet. And then if you'd have the audacity to say, show me your Bible. I can tell how much you love your Bible. You know, one of the comments I get from little old ladies on Coffee with the Colonel, they say, we love the way you rub your Bible. They do. They comment on her and say, we, we love the way you, I love the way you rub your Bible. I do that a lot. I love my Bible. This Bible saved me. There's a guy that lives in my house named Steve that gets in the way, and this Bible helps with that guy a lot. I don't know what your guy's name is, but my guy's name is Steve, and my Bible helps a lot. How many of y'all would agree we need this book? And if we realized, it will accomplish everything. Everything. And here's the best part. It will renew your mind so you can elevate your thinking and reach your highest potential to the glory of God 
all because of this road. Not your potential to fill your billfold, but your potential of productivity and fruitfulness. All to the glory of God. This word will elevate your faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many of y'all heard me tell you before? Go home and read your Bibles out loud because your voice is the voice that you believe the most. That's what's wrong with most of us. We believe what we say about us. How many of y'all have said anything good about yourself in a long time? I mean, that's a pretty fair question. We're pretty easy to criticize ourselves, aren't we? Oh, I'm a little old. I'm a little bald. I'm a little frumpy. I got this old boy right here, you know. What's the good stuff? What's the good stuff? If we'd say a little more positive stuff to each other and a little more positive stuff about ourselves, we'd probably believe that about ourselves. But if we'll read the Bible out loud, our minds will receive it because our voice is the one we believe the most. And it'll begin to create faith. That faith come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How many of y'all got something out of this tonight? Is there anything you can take home with you tonight to make your kitchen table a better place? Make your workplace a better place. Is there anything out of here? Is there anything you might start doing in the morning that you didn't do today? This is it. That's all I got. I just want to come give a little encouragement to one of the best groups of people on the planet. That's getting this word. I don't care what they say outside this building. I don't care the reports they give. I don't care how that works because that's not how my Bible says. And how many of y'all know that your TV might lie to you? You know what they found out the other day when they made the discovery? Everything that's on Facebook may not be the truth. Do you know Google could be tainted just a tick? Huh? I mean, y'all know this won't lie to you. It'll tell you the truth. Read it for yourself. Read it for yourself. If you hit a snag, stop right there because that's the most important place. When you get to that one spot, and I know everybody gets there where you go, Ugh, that don't make no sense. Stay there. Don't move. Jesus, I need understanding. Because that's the downfall of religion in America today. We train people to understand the Bible and then come tell us what they found out. There's no need. The author and perfecter of this book is near. What did it say in the first verse? Seek the Lord while he may be found and while he's near. John fourteen twenty six. I'll send you the Holy Spirit who will teach you all things and remind you of everything that Jesus said. The book of Titus says you need no man to be your teacher. The anointing will teach you. Apart from the Holy Spirit, there is no understanding. Under the coaching and dwelling of the Holy Spirit, the enlightening happens. And every one of you, I don't care how you was raised, Every one of you have been given everything necessary for life and godliness if you're born again. And that includes the Spirit of God who will reveal to you who He is through His Word. Okay? Take that with you. Go be different. Let the Word of God do what it's going to do. Don't be afraid of this Bible. Don't be afraid of it. This thing's not scary. Don't be afraid of it, okay? All right. Anybody got anything else? All right, let's pray and we'll quit. <laughs> Lord, I just want to thank you tonight for your word, that infallible, perfect word, the word that's the truth, the truth that will set us free. Lord, I thank you for it. Lord, help us all to, to seek your word and seek you where you can be found now. Let us realize, Lord, how powerful and effective this word is. The outcome of this word is amazing. Help us 
not take it for granted. So, Lord, tonight we bless you. I pray, Lord, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit as you minister to each one of us that we we would find ourselves dwelling in your presence, hear your voice. That, Lord, we even feel your presence. That we'd receive your instruction and your revelation. We're your people, Lord, and you're our God. We give you praise and we give you glory tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, Jesus. Amen.